Well, welcome everybody to the panel discussion this evening on cholera, the first modern global pandemic. I am William McDonald, a professor in the Department of Religion and Philosophy here at Tennessee Wesleyan. And it's good to see uh, folks here for this, what promises to be an engaging uh, week of discussion and certainly an engaging panel tonight. Um, I will introduce our speakers uh, in turn before they uh, speak. And uh, at the end of uh, the three presentations, uh, there will be time for question and answer. And so if you have a question that you would like to address to the panel uh, in general or the panelists in particular, if you would uh, type that out in the chat box and I will, um, uh, at the end of the, the three presentations, um, uh, offer those questions to our speakers. First uh, is Dr. Tara Prairie. Dr. Tara Prairie joined the Department of Health and Human Performance at Tennessee Wesleyan University as an assistant professor in 2019, teaching health professions courses. She has since turned the health professions major into a public health major. Dr. Prairie has a passion for community service and promotes service learning within her classes by creating community collaborations to help address the evolving needs of the Athens region. Dr. Prairie strives to develop her health professions classes to fit along with TWU's mission to prepare students for a life of leadership and service in an ever-changing global community. Her talk is entitled Cholera to COVID, How the Struggles Remain the Same. Dr. Prairie. Sorry, am I, am, I, am I unmuted now? Right, I hear you, yes. Okay, good, sorry, thank you. Oh, and can you please turn on my video? Uh, it says I can't turn it on. I think Jack may need to do that since I hosted him. Okay. There. Okay. <laughs> we'll get used to this. <laughs> so can everyone see the presentation okay? Yes. Okay, great. So thank you for that introduction. I ended up doing a talk on cholera to COVID, how struggles remain the same. I um, was initially going, I was initially studying to what extent Jon Snow would react to COVID-19. And then um, just with further research outside of what we learn in our textbooks, I just realized just how much of a, the social justice issues that come with an epidemic and pandemic um, really haven't changed that much since 1854. And so I changed my presentation based on that, um, just from the inspiration of the research. So I have a brief timeline. I'm just gonna go over briefly some of the preventative measures um, that have basically stayed within public health since um, actually the plague. Uh, I'm gonna talk about John Snow and Filippo Pacini and their work with cholera initially, then um, how they struggled because the main theory of miasma led with um, infectious disease at the time. And then briefly discuss Robert Koch and germ theory address COVID and some of the similarities between COVID and cholera, and then conclude with how would Jon Snow react to COVID? Or just like how, how much, you know, how much has changed, but also stayed the same. And so by the time the 1854 cholera epidemic occurred in London, isolation or quarantine measures had become a primary method of prevention of disease. 
animals, goods, and persons that may have been exposed to a contagious disease were separated from the community and often waited for some kind of disinfection, fumigation, or a bill of health issued to ships at ports. Um, infected people were often quarantined within their homes in hopes someone would be kind enough to bring them provisions to survive. Um, plague and later cholera hospitals were built to help cities overrun with epidemics. And so there's a view of a cholera hospital that was off of the Oxford Canal. And um, specific to mass, the now infamous plague doctor mask was first described by Charles Delorme, a royal physician in France during the 1619 plague outbreak. In Paris, as a uniform he created for himself to prevent transmission of disease, the mask then became associated with plague epidemics in Naples and Rome during 1656 and are still worn in Italy during Carnival celebrations prior to Lent. The plague doctor in the slide is from a mid 1600s engraving by Gerhard Alzenbach, but is still likely to be satire since the title actually translates to Dr. Beaky of Rome. And he warns that Dr. Beaky will take your money but still allow you to die. So it was, it's been assumed as satire. Um, and so what's interesting about the plague mass is we have this association, especially we've seen a revival of them as art around COVID, but despite the fact that both plague and cholera were associated with pestilential miasma or disease-ridden air, the mass, the plague mass, are not depicted in artwork or description of doctors treating cholera patients. As depicted in this image by Johann Wunder, to avoid cholera from haunting him, so you can see the cholera ghost behind him, the cholera prevention man wears a mask. And I read that um, prevention man's doctors would soak their masks in vinegar or other um, type of smelly substances to um, prevent miasmas and surrounding himself, um, as you can see with topical oils, which included peppermint and coriander, to increase circulation in various substances for enemas, including tobacco smoke. And so I don't know if you can see that he's smoking a pipe. Um, so, but despite all these efforts at the time, what um, with cholera being a waterborne disease, they were futile since people are infected from drinking water or consumption of cross-contaminated fruits or vegetables. And I think that's what's frustrating about this history and some of the misinformation that was about during cholera. And then we're seeing similar types of misinformation now. And so John Snow lived close to the area that was most infected, impacted um, in London with the 1854 epidemic and started studying the issue and to which he became known as the father of epidemiology because he conducted a natural experiment. And what he did is basically um, a pre-martyr version of what we know now as contact tracing. He went door to door, asked people about cholera. From understanding he was asking people about cholera cases and also the water source. And from the data he collected, he created the now famous spot map that you can see on the slide and determined that the motor transmission was the waterborne was waterborne and the broad street pump was the source of the epidemic and so i circled the pump and so you can see where the majority of cases are and then if you can see some of the outer dots which are outliers he interviewed those people as well and found that even though those people moved further away from the Broad Street pump, they still preferred that water and so they would travel to get their water to the Broad Street pump, hence why they had cases of cholera. And so he presented this to local authorities, but instead of um, getting a parade, being held as a hero, his findings were met with suspicion and basically he had to continuously lobby the local government to get the Broad Street pump handle removed. And so unbeknownst to Jon Snow at the same time, in Florence, Italy, Filippo Piccini actually identified the bacteria that causes color by performing an autopsy and examining intestinal mucosa through a microscope. Um, despite his discovery though, Piccini too is largely ignored by science at the time. And so a critique of John Snow's was that he, even though he has this evidence, they um, he was criticized for not having like a specific organism like 
that he could speak to to show. And then here we have Filippo Pacini, who has found the organism, and he's still being ignored because my miasma is the, the prevalent theory at the time. And unfortunately, at this time in 1854, we didn't have open access to journals and such. And so nobody really knew about Pacini's work outside of Italy until years later. And so, which is unfortunate to them is that they made these discoveries, as I said, during a period in history when my asthma theory is the most widely accepted theory on infection. And supporters of the theory believe that air became charged with an epidemic influence when combined with foul smelling decayed matter. And from my research, what I have found is that the theory seems to have been used by some as a way to further stigmatize people living in impoverished sections of the city and a way to spark resentment between um, people living in those sections and also um, with groups of color. Um, it was to spark a resentment, fear, and division as cholera was a disease associated with poverty and or Asian cultures at the time. Um, sanitation efforts eventually helped in reducing transmission of the disease in London, but full acceptance of John Snow's theory on germs could have saved thousands of lives. And so it's also important within the social justice realm to understand that cholera emerged at a time of increased globalization due to trade and transportation. And it became known as an Asiatic disease as it originated in South Asia. And so at the time, we have individuals of South Asian descent dealing with increased instances of harassment and violence. But then we also have merchants who are involved with trade and complaining that social intervention measures such as quarantining and cordon efforts along with border crossings and ports hindered free movement of travel and trade. And so you have a, one group worrying about potential profit and the um, potential economy that's how that they're going to be impacted and completely discounting another group or groups that are being negatively impacted through um, stigmatization and discrimination and violence. And so we have this, we have the cholera epidemic. And then almost 30 years after John Snow wrote on the mode of communication of cholera, Robert Koch in 1883 discovered, once again, the bacteria responsible for cholera, confirming the work of both Snow and Piccini um, posthumously, um, a co-founder of microbiology along with Louis Pasteur, so I'm sure this might be repetitive for some people, their work conclusively established germ theory that microorganisms known as pathogens or germs can lead to disease. So we have that confirmation, it's substantiated by evidence, but unfortunately, the advent of germ theory did not end the hatred and blame often associated with disease. And so throughout history, including but not limited to Ebola, the great influenza of 1918, HIV AIDS, swine flu, and now COVID-19, we have seen epidemics blamed on various groups of people throughout history. Um, COVID-19 itself is one of seven coronaviruses that can infect humans and one of hundreds of known strains. It is caused by severe acute respiratory syndrome, coronavirus 2. But what's actually interesting is the first coronavirus was identified in 1964 from a sample taken in 1930 from a chicken epidemic in North Dakota and Minnesota. And so we have the first coronavirus found associated with the Midwest of the United States. And yet, because this specific coronavirus strain that we are dealing with presently originated from Wuhan, China, the American Asian Pacific Islander population has faced increased instances of discrimination and violence. And just like the merchants involved in trade during the cholera epidemic of 1854, some individuals currently associate proven social intervention measures such as quarantining, which has been in place since 1353 after um, the Black Plague, and wearing masks, and masks as we know the premise since the early 1900s. They see those basic social prevention measures as an encroachment on their freedom. And I find this particularly interesting and want to research this to connect more in that with infectious disease, especially diseases that can lead to epidemics, individualism does not exist with medicine and within medicine without consequences. Whether it is helping to assure water sources stay free from contagions as a result of hygienic practices or wearing a mask 
quarantining and social distancing to assure people do not spread respiratory droplets, we are dependent upon each other to stay healthy, not get sick or worse die. Freedom and individuality are important and should be respected, but not to the detriment of others who may get sick and or die because of our actions. And so the original title of my presentation was going to be, How Would Jon Snow React to COVID? And as I started my research, I realized that despite the great technological advancements in medicine since 1854, we are still seeing the same struggles Jon Snow and other scientists face showing that with great change, so much also stays the same. So I imagine Jon Snow's reaction would be bittersweet. He would have a moment of being honored that he's considered the father of epidemiology and that his work in cholera was proven to be true. He would also be happy that germ theory is the accepted scientific theory for disease and social intervention is still proven and a powerful tool for mitigating outbreaks. And the same types of tools that he used and subsequent public health people after him and epidemiologists, they're still around and they're still proven. But however, after that magic wore off, he would have a kind of a, um, sorry, this is a map showing just the difference, the space between Italy and France at the time when um, Piccini and Snow were doing their work. And then as far as Jon Snow, I feel like he would have like a really, really moment in that realizing the struggles that he and other scientists face with distress and the disparities in health that continue along with the need to identify a group and other to blame still exist. As far as how we prevent this, I believe the circular pattern of distrust and blame speaks to generational gaps in knowledge or as the symposium is titled, epidemics and amnesia. It seems that unless someone is in the field as a student or professional, society generally does not think about public health or epidemiology until it becomes an issue. And even then, any intervention that may require change or a slight inconvenience is met with doubt or seen as an overreaction or unnecessary instead of appreciating that maybe it actually worked. So perhaps weaving epidemiology into the curricula of other school subjects would help. Um, COVID-19 will definitely not be the last pandemic, but for the next one, it would be great if communities rallied together because they are dealing with a novel disease, but they remember or have documentation of proven social interventions that work best during COVID. They have ways to assure people and businesses feel supported throughout the epidemic until they figure it out via treatment and or a vaccine. States and countries that did this during the COVID-19 pandemic they were su relatively successful in flattening the curve. And it's what we all deserved and is what future generations deserve. And that is the end of my presentation and I have references as needed. So, thank you. And Yes, thank you, Dr. Prairie. Our next speaker is Dr. John Davis. Dr. Davis is a native of Kentucky. He has a PhD from the University of Kentucky in Russian history, 988 to the present, European history, 1815 to the present, and environmental history. He is the author of Russia in the Time of Cholera, Disease Under Romanovs and Soviets, which was published in 2018. He also has a law enforcement background. John is currently Associate Professor of History at Hopkinsville Community College in Hopkinsville, Kentucky. He is interested in disease and environment, including climate and geography. His talk is entitled Cholera, the Disease of the 19th Century. Dr. John Davis. <laughs> 
Well, thank you, Dr. <laughs> uh, Professor McDonald. And uh, thank you very much to Professor Prairie for that wonderful presentation. Wow, a uh, uh, tough act to follow there very much. I do have a, a couple of illustrations. Uh, can, I, can I share my screen briefly or um, it, it, I could probably go without them if, if, if that's okay, if, if uh, that can't be done. You should be able to see the share screen button at the bottom. It's, it's in green. In green. No, I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm not, maybe I'm on. Uh... Let me see. Um, do I, I think I have to make you a host. Okay. So I'm making new host now. And All right. uh, do you see the share screen now? Share screen. This is at the bottom of. It should be, yeah, it'll be at the bottom of your screen um, in between chat and pause, stop recording. Maybe, I don't, I don't know if we're looking at the same. I see chat reactions, closed caption, record. No. I'm sorry, just. That's okay, that's okay. okay. Let, let me just go ahead and, and go and, and uh, maybe maybe uh, we'll get this later, but. Um, oh. oh, wait, do I need to turn on your, maybe I need to, no, I need to turn on your video. Is that, who need? Do I, Sorry, um, that's okay. <laughs> Perfectly okay. All right, thank you very much. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is is cholera, the, the disease of the 19th century, and uh, it, it it was the disease of the 19th century in memory and in in history in, in many ways, although. Uh, there is a difference between historical memory, what actually happened, and collective memory. As, as Professor Prairie mentioned in, in that wonderful presentation, uh, what a group tend to, uh, people tend to re remember can be narcissistic. World War II is the classic example. How, we won the war, right? Uh, so there are, are, are is, is collective memory, what various groups will, will, will think about, and, and historical memory. Uh, most memory centers on aspects of modernity in one way or the other. Uh, as Professor Prairie was, was very much told us, we, we cr create myths about the other. So the United States and, and, and about ourselves too, the United States and the British, the last epidemic was in 1860. We wiped it out, right, with the germ theory. Not exactly right, as, as Professor Prairie uh, mentioned. Uh, Russia, both early and late, it, it was backwards. And, and since my work is on Russia, you're going you're to hear uh, Russia quite a bit. They had the earliest epidemics, which kind of made them a leader at the time, but then later the late epidemics uh, was a way to cast aspersion on them. Uh, cholera was defeated. Well, it, it's never really defeated. In fact, the, one of the largest epidemics in history is going on right now uh, in, in the seventh pandemic in, in, um, uh, on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, so, and, and that is a consequence of geopolitics. Uh, but, but of course, we can easily write it off as the other. Russia still suffers from, from cases occasionally, which we like to think makes them, uh, them uh, backward. So reactive calm, uh, re relative calm, we didn't have any cholera riots here. That's simply not the case. Uh, in, 19, in, in 1892, uh, we had swarms of people on the docks in New York uh, waiting for... for uh, Russian Jews it just dare, daring them to get off, and they were stuck out in the boat. Very, very many well people during the 1892 uh, epidemic. We don't know a lot about this, uh, vaccines here. Uh, we, we don't associate cholera and vaccines. Uh, we, we tend to feel that only a quarantine was necessary. So this thing with vaccine uh, is new to us. But uh, Quarantine was was it, we were, it worked in the United States because we had a whole ocean between us and the source of the of the, the pandemic, and which helped them a lot. And we had relatively few ports that we could perform quarantine, and it and it helped. But as as uh, the professor said, it did not stop it at all. Okay, so so the idea that that um, they didn't know how to perform a quarantine, and when they did, they had cholera riots. Uh, 
and we didn't have that. Again, not entirely true. Cholera was a disease, disease of backwardness. I say no. Uh, often poverty and hardship and, and just bad luck of where you were in the in the order in, in the pecking order. Okay, so paradox of, of modernity, in, in, in my opinion, as I argued in my book, a nation must defeat cholera to be modern. So to defeat cholera, you must have cholera, right? Uh, so how do you get cholera? Well, you get it be, by being a major player on the international scene. Uh, and throughout the 19th century, the Russians were. Uh, commerce and technology uh, and, and the technologies related to commerce and, and economics is, is very important. Uh, if, if you wanted to improve your economic uh, station as a nation, you had to compete with the great powers. And Russia was very much in that, that, um, that predicament that they had to, to compete with England and Germany and all the behemoths of uh, the United States. And they were lagging behind, and, and rightfully so. Their industrialization came up late. And uh, this is part of why they, they uh, suffered cholera late. Uh, th their development was a bit slower than ours. Okay, the railroad, of course, the, the, the development of railroads, quarantine and violence and lack of violence, I've already mentioned. Science, uh, more powerful microscopes, how, how good of scientists you had. Uh, this is one of the reasons you don't have cholera, right? Not always. Russian scientists were absolutely on the on the forefront of, of modern medicine. They were just as good as any scientist anywhere. Uh, purified water sources. Here's where the Russians lagged a little bit. Again, they were they were uh, had a hard time producing water sources, which are very expensive, and sometimes they would have to get some second hand ones from the British and to have canalization and sewer systems in in many Russian cities was incredibly difficult even to consider because they were lower, like St. Petersburg is, is almost as low as the Baltic Sea. And the same at the other end, at the Southern end of, of Russia in Astrakhan, uh, very low line cities with huge river uh, systems, which could become infected. And this was a major problem for them. Again, vaccines in Russia, Russia was ultimately used to subdue cholera. They, they, they were not able to, to use quarantine to stop everybody from coming into a country that covers one sixth of the world's land surfaces. And they were surrounded by cholera carriers. So uh, what they had to do ultimately is to create a reactive uh, system of, of quarantine where they reacted and, and they found the threats and they just vaccinated everybody in sight. And, and this is ultimately what stopped cholera along with rehydration therapy which um, comes along a little bit later, but they, they were doing things like this. They were, they were finding their most vulnerable peoples in cities that were under threat, and they would immediately give them uh, water that was boiled. They knew that if you boiled water, it, it, um, it, it killed the germs, and, and uh, they, they, this is another thing they used. So they used a shotgun approach, but they used it in very specified ways in, in uh, populations that were under threat. And it worked very well. By, by 1925, they had largely defeated cholera. Um, and and the, the problems that happened in Russia really uh, kept it around that long to begin with, as we'll talk about here. So let's talk about some of the problems that Russia faced. And, and we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about how um, volcanoes and famines and economics played into pandemics. Uh, cholera we first know of it in the 1770s in India, Ceylon, and Burma. So it was endemic to these areas. Uh, you also, in the 1770s, had a little ice age climate. Some of the coldest days in history um, are, are going to come about still at, at, during the, the little ice age as we know it. You have revolutions, and, and I, I, had, I think this exacerbates economic situations to the extent where you, 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 be, you have revolutions in the 1770s, the American Revolution, right? We know, all know about bloody footprints in the snow at Valley Forge and, and smallpox epidemics, Shays Rebellion in 1786 and 1787 in Massachusetts, tremendously important rebellion where you have these Western farmers who can't eke out a living, going to war, uh, uh, basically, literally with the Massachusetts government. Uh, the, the, and the bankers in Boston, it's an economic warfare. And then, of course, the French Revolution, which starts at, at um, 
with with famine in 1789 when women hit the streets you you know they, when women hit the streets uh, a certain substance hits the fan this this was uh absolutely in both revo large revolutions the french revolution the russian revolution it was the ladies who largely sparked these revolutions now why am i talking about revolutions because cholera and revolutions um pretty much coexist they're not doing that yet in 1789 so you didn't get cholera and napoleon when he comes to uh he, he comes to russia in 1812 two volcanoes going off at the time very cold weather as we know and uh, he's turned back and the russians use the weather to defeat him spreads typhus through through russia but not cholera um, there's so there's this series of volcanoes going on between 1809 and 1819. The coldest decade in history, recorded history, you have storms, droughts, frost, and famines, uh, which are going to play a, a big role in Colorado. The 1809 unknown volcano was the largest of its time until April 15, 1815, uh, when you had the Tambora volcano and the Sunda Arc of Indonesia which initiated the forces that launched cholera pandemics. So I should be uh, enlighten you on, on what these forces are. The, the volcano uh, is believed to have unleashed heat and, and it's a, a consequences of the El Nino. And, and I really don't wanna go into all that unless we have to, because uh, I could go on and on and on, but the, uh, but the, the volcano changes tides and, and it changes the temperature in the Bay of Bengal and you get uh, the forces mobilized on the floor of estuaries at, at, where the Ganges rivers meets the uh, the Bay of Bengal, and these and this is where cholera is made. This is where the the, the chemicals are unleashed. Um, they call it um, a a a, um, a a a blind space or, or a deep space, a space where there is no oxygen. And this, these are things actually that Tam, that uh, Pasteur uh, later will talk about, although they, they don't match it up with cholera, but these things are happening in 1815. The cholera is being mobilized and also the, the volcano and the El Nino, uh, it interferes with the, uh, the Asian monsoon uh, so you get storms, droughts, and frosts, and famines. You get people walking around who haven't had enough to eat. So what are they going to do if you're on the if you're on the Ganges River? You haven't had enough to eat during the the, the droughts when the the water is is disappearing. Uh, you can just reach into the water and grab fish. The problem with is that these fish are now uh, tainted with cholera, and you have people dying in massive numbers in in the Bay of Bengal in 1815. Uh, so th this happens again and again and again, and, and the CDC recognizes famine as a predisposing factor to cholera. It was again and again and again, famine and also um, uh, typhus and some other diseases are known as famine related diseases. Okay, then they were spread uh, by technology by technology out of the Bay of Bengal. 1816, you have the year without summer, uh, the, the Tambora volcano was so powerful that a year later, you, the volcanic ash blocked out the sun. And we all know about Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as watching the Frankenstein Chronicles over the weekend. And they had a cholera pandemic. And this is, is what unleashed the cholera pandemics of the, the, the 19th century. The first cholera pandemic uh, started in 1817 when Lord Hastings' Grand Army in Maratha uh, suffered 10,000 dead and they spread it out of, are the, are the first ones to have believed to have spread it out of uh, the, the Bay of Bengal, this area of Maratha in Northern India, where the British had a lot of economic interest. And this is what Lord Hastings is doing there. He's in the middle of the Maratha War. Uh, the, the, the factory there has ties to industry in Birmingham. Uh, it doesn't spread right away out of, out of uh, India. It spread throughout the Middle East. You had cholera it, as far as Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia on the Russian border. Uh, but the Russians were a, uh, controlled border peoples by controlling salt and famine. Uh, or, and so you control salt, you control the diet, and uh, they, they control people by initiating a famine, which probably didn't help matters much. Uh, in 1823, cholera stalled at Astrakhan in southern Russia, which is on an estuary right there in the Caspian Sea, a very vulnerable place 
to, uh, to cholera, suffered in 1823, 392 cases and 205 deaths. And that's as far as it went at that time. Okay, uh, the second pandemic uh, and the hungry 40s, you, you had war with the Ottomans in the late 1820s. The, the Russians were, were constantly at war with the Ottomans. Um, August 26, 1829, just before you have a treaty, you have the Persian caravans carrying the Vibrio across. The Vibrio is the bacterial agent that causes disease. The Persian caravans carry it across the border, and the first Russian soldier fell ill at Orenburg, uh, right there in the breadbasket of Russia, the wheat fields of Orenburg. This is not a good sign. Probably means that there's some type of a famine going on at that time. Uh, because this is, is, is in the middle of the breadbasket. Uh, so from 1830 to 38, it spread across Russia, 250,000 lives, 500,000 cases, about a 50% uh, mortality rate. So that, that, you know, one in two is going to die. And as you can imagine, it, this is was, this was a very terrible death. People turned blue, their eyes sunk in, their bodies would move after they were dead. They had horrible cramps. This was not a good way to die, and people have seen this. It was a, ter a terrifying um, experience. So you, you, you get, for the next eight years or so, uh, cholera being spread across Russia. It, it also spreads to Western Europe and over to the United States in the 1830s, as, as we know. 1835 to 1841, while these, these uh, cholera epidemics are winding down, you start ha having another series of volcanoes, nearly the equal of, of 1811 to 1818, in the Sunda Arca in Indonesia, which are going to initiate these, these forces again. And in, as we know, the 18 forces were the 1840s were called the Hungry 40s for a reason. 18, uh, you, 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 everybody knows about the, the Irish potato famine, right? But we don't know about the horrible famines uh, in, in the 1840s across Europe. Coinc or not coincidentally, you have the greatest series of revolutions in European history in the 1840s, in 1848, which is also the uh, biggest cholera epidemic in history. There is an entire fond in Russia on the, the 1848 epidemic. Nobody studies it. Now, this is something to think about with memory. Uh, some of the biggest pandemics, people just sort of brush by, and, and they haven't really been, been taken, taken into account like the other smaller ones have. For one thing, we're scholars, right? We know we can manage smaller amounts of data better. Uh, there is a huge amount of data on the 1848 uh, cholera pa pandemic and revolution just waiting to be studied. So 1846, on, on the borderlines, you have raids by starving Bedouins, uh, the, the Arabs uh, along the, the, Rus the Russians have contact with. And it, by 1848 in Russia, you have 1,742,439 cases and 690,150 deaths. Um, between 1857 and 1851, 1 million deaths and 2.5 million cases. So again, just under uh, a 50% mortality, about a 40% mortality, uh, and uh, really the worst pandemics in history the second wave, does that sound familiar? Uh, th this was it, and, and, and we, we experienced it ourselves, right, uh, with the COVID. Okay, 1852 to 59, you had the Crimean War and the third pandemic. Uh, you had Russian imperialism in Kazakhstan. The Russians were always uh, meddling, and, and they were very much imperialist, and, and they were actually uh, competing with Great Britain for, uh, in the so-called great game in the, in the late 19th century, perhaps. Uh, Professor Seitz will talk more about that. Uh, I, I don't know a great deal about it, but it was very much a competition and you had it, it, the imperialism. And this is very much why the British are, are, are teaming with the Ottomans and the French to put the Russians down, which they do in, 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 in great form. Um, you have at the front fatigue, exposure, malnutrition among the armies in the Balkans. Uh, of course, you had starving British soldiers which I argue in my book almost certainly contributed in some way to the 1840, 1854 epidemic in London. I, I don't know that. I haven't studied it in force. I know the first victim was, was eating in a restaurant near the Broad Street pump. <laughs> so um, I, I, I think in London, there was probably some, some famine going on as well. And, and of course, this is not against germ theory, but germ theory works much better, particularly with cholera, among emaciated people. 
Okay, the Austrian army of occupation suffered 155,000 cholera deaths. That's the Austrians. This is not the backwards Russians. This, this is the, the European Austrians, or at least Central Europeans. Uh, the Russians, 231, 410 deaths. You have this fellow at the front by the name of N.I. Pirogov, who really becomes the hero of Russian medicine. And he comes up with an idea that starvation is so terrible in, in our country that we just need to start feeding people. That We, we can't practice medicine without, uh, without with, with people are starving to death. Okay, and that becomes very much a staple of Russian med medicine uh, after 1865. So 1865 to 1873, you have the fourth pandemic and the great reforms. And the great uh, preventive medicine is part of the great reforms. You have food crises in, in 1865, plus new railroad construction equals another epidemic. And, and they had an epidemic in the eight, in, right after that in, in the 1860s. Famine relief was handed over to a, a new entity called the Zimpsvas, uh, which was it, it, local councils composed of teachers uh, who were about 50% of the Zimpsvas, lawyers, felchers, statisticians, bookkeepers, uh, on the, at the state level, at the local level, but the state blocked the reform. They, 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 they put the, the, the reform in their, the problem in their lap, and then they blocked the reform over and over again. And, and the state was really the biggest problem that the, the, the Russians had. They had some very good people and the Zimpsvas had great people. Okay, so again, famine was so widespread that physicians emphasized preventive medicine. 1867 to 71, you had El Nino and climate related catastrophes in India and China. This is well documented. You can read Mike Davis's A, a Victorian Holocaust about the awful, terrible uh, conditions between 1870 and 1900 in India. I, my textbook calls this, it, it's all part of what we call the new imperialism. And it was very much created a, a man-made uh, man catastrophe, a man-made famine. Although the British, this was not their intent, they tried very hard to to uh, to respond to it, uh, but modernity was, you know, they're getting all the, all these materials out of India, and and this is much stronger than 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 uh, pre, pre, you know responding to difficulties, right? They looked at this as just logistical difficulties. That doesn't mean that that the, the local governors did not care about these people. I, th I think they really did but uh, they, they weren't able to do a lot about it. Okay, so cholera was sporadic and lower than usual in Russia in the 1860s. Uh, this could have been because of no volcanoes, I, I, who knows, but there was a pretty good epidemic in 1865 over the newly built railroad. You, had fa you did get famine in the lower Volga by, in 1877, and, and you had the plague in Astrakhan in 1878, uh, part of the, the third plague pandemic that nobody knows a whole lot about, really. I mean, as some people do. I, I went to Ohio State uh, with a, a colleague who was writing on the third plague pan, pandemic, a very interesting phenomenon. But cholera, by, by this time, everybody was much more afraid of it. And, it, and it's coming again. Uh, so you have uh, Krakatoa volcano and the, the fifth pandemic. So the crack of Toa, Toa volcano in 1883 unleashes the economic and, and, the, and the forces, the, the, the biological forces that are gonna again bring cholera back to Russia and, and uh, throughout much, not, not much of Europe, uh, but you do have that, that, pan, that uh, epidemic in Hamburg that Richard Evans wrote about in his very uh, well-known book. Okay. So in 1883, you, you get the Krakatoa volcano, you get some record low temperatures in Siberia. I mean, the coldest days on record in the, around 1885, 86 in Siberia. This, this is absolutely related. And, and then you get a, uh, the Russian government is starting to tax people, I, perhaps because they, well, for one thing, they wanna build an empire. They wanna compete with, with the, the other Europeans. The second, maybe things aren't, aren't going so well. Uh, so, and, and, and indeed they're not in 1891, you have a terrible famine in Russia, one of the worst in history. Uh, you had famine relief, which actually was interfered with, but uh, wasn't bad actually. Uh, in this time, the government was not as bad. It actually helped out a bit. Uh, they, they, so they had a pretty good response, but 1891 is generally seen as, as mobilizing the, the, um, 
the intelligentsia, the fifth pandemic and the 1892 cholera epidemic followed the following year, 600,000 cases, 290,000 deaths. The response was, again, was considered good. The second year uh, was not as bad. This was a very virulent new strain of, of cholera. And this is the, the, the cholera uh, uh, vibrio that Robert Koch finds. And, and I very much appreciate Professor Prairie's um, talking about um, Pacini, and, because Pacini is really an unsung hero. New air railroads were intended for military exploits linked Central Asia, Southern Central Russia, the Volga and Siberia. So there's your modernity and the, vo uh, the Vibrio is unleashed. Uh, it took them a, a few years, but they did a pretty good job of reining it in until famine hit again. You had the Great Famine in India between 1897 and 1900 and the sixth pandemic, uh, which is gonna start in 1902 in Russia, 277,274 uh, casualties, 167,167 deaths. Uh, so again, this is in conjunction with the Great Famine in India, uh, and you have some El Nino activities and, and the like. Uh, this is really just a continuation of 1892 uh, in some ways, I think. Uh, cholera and Astrakhan uh, in Siberia along new train tracks. The Russians were building record numbers of, of railroad track miles at the very time that this new strain of cholera, this, this was a terrible uh, coincidence, which spread cholera all over Russia. Um, they actually stop it at Astrakhan in 1902. The Prigorov Society, the, which is the biggest society of Russian public physicians, the ones who work for the Zemsa, were distributing food all over. But the government again got defensive and told them to stand down. Uh, so in 1904, you had a cholera epidemic hit Saratov uh, in pretty good force. Luckily, it was in, in it was late and it didn't really develop. Uh, in great force as it had in the past. The following year you had in 1905, you had the revolution and, and the great cholera fear that did not materialize. So a couple of years went by and then you had in 1907 on the, again, on the, the, the in the aftermath of record numbers of railroad track, uh, the 1907 cholera epidemic in Samara, which becomes the 1908 great St. Petersburg epidemic, which was pretty much uh, the equal of the, um, the, the, the epidemic that Evans talked about um, in, in uh, Hamburg. Okay, in 1909, you have a few cases. And then in, in 1910, the, the 1910 epidemic in Russia was the largest of the 20th century. It spread throughout the entire country, every single district in the country. And again, this is, is largely a product of the railroad, which is often ignored when we talk about cholera, but the railroad spread cholera, cholera all around the, set, the uh, country. And this, again, it's the largest of the 20th century. I wrote about uh, the, the, the sixth pandemic, but I sort of uh, didn't do justice to the 1910 epidemic, admittedly. It's, it's, a, it's a project all in itself. Uh, I, I probably have a lot of, of, of materials to do it. 1914, uh, it, it, it's under control again. You have a few cases, but of course, the, the great conflagration that we know as World War I breaks out. Uh, the Prigorov Society, again, and, and, and the Zemspa physicians are saying, we need to get on this right away. Uh, and, and the government mobilized too slow. In 1915, you had a, a famine and, and an epidemic in Moscow. But it is pretty much brought under control by, by and I, I argue that, that it was vaccine a lot for the first time. They're really out there putting down vaccination in force. And it, and it kept cholera under control in 1915. Uh, that's not going to remain the case. In 1917, you have the revolutions. You have 1918 famine and epidemics in St. Petersburg on the heels of the revolutions. And in 1921, you have the great, a great famine uh, as, as a result of the Russian Civil War and pan uh, epidemics in Moscow on the lower Volga that are going to last right into 1924 when they finally get it under control uh, at the end of the Civil War. So it, it, as long as you have war and hunger, and, and, and Russia during those periods, and you have the, this, this micro mobilized through these uh, channels of nature, you're probably going to have cholera. And, and so that's all I have right now. I, I hope uh, you'll have a, a lot of questions, but I'm going to turn it back over to our host. Thank you very much.
I am clicking on the dots below. And I guess I go into participants to find. There. Yes. Is it does that do it? I'm on. Yeah, I okay, think that great. works. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Davis, for that informative talk. And we move now to uh, Professor Jack Seitz. He is Assistant Professor of History at Tennessee Wesleyan University, where he teaches courses in European and Eurasian history. He earned his PhD from Iowa State University in the Rural Agricultural Technological Environmental History Program. He is currently working on a book manuscript based on his dissertation, tentatively entitled, Unsettled Science, Agronomists, Nomads, and the Settler Colony of the Kazakh Steppe, 1881 to 1917. His talk is entitled Cholera, Infrastructure, and Imperialism on the Kazakh Steppe in the Early 20th Century. Dr. Jack Seitz. I am trying to make him um, Yes. Gotcha. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, appreciate that um, introduction, uh, William and um, uh, also the really interesting uh, talks. I, we're, we're kind of had some zooming out, I think, from uh, what um, Professor Davis had to say about cholera and epidemics. I'm going to go in a little bit more depth into 1910 in a, in a specific place. And we kind of have a, a good overall coverage of um, from Dr. Perry's comments um, overall. So I'm looking forward to some questions here in the end. What I really have to um, talk about is... Um, uh, um, uh, infrastructure and, and, and power, really, which I think are some questions that um, uh, Dr. Davis was also getting to, um, but also just kind of the question that I'm interested in is, you know, how um, disease sort of interacts with and, and how disease um, brings forward uh, certain um, questions and, and let's say truths um, maybe about our society. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, the Kazakh steppe, which is uh, located mostly uh, in what is today um, Kazakhstan. I'm not totally sure if I've got the, the sharing power, but um, if, if not, <laughs> we'll just do this orally. Um, and so with the Kazakh steppe, the, the, uh, people don't often know that much about it. It's, you know, this space in between Russia and India and China. Um, it is something like the eastern uh, Montana or western Nebraska, this kind of high arid plains. And that aridity, that dryness is really a crucial part. Um, and how I got interested in, in cholera was because uh, through infrastructure and water, I'm not actually, um, don't have a particular background in disease, kind of stumbled into it looking for water, um, I found I found cholera. Um, and uh, the other part that is important to know that's very similar to um, understanding settlement or understanding the, this story that I have to tell is that like the United States, we have a very similar um, settler colony develop, um, you know, uh, the destruction of a uh, indigenous people who are nomads, that is they migrate from place to place, just like um, uh, say the Sioux or some other group uh, in the American West, the Kazakhs are much the same. Um, and so this is a story of colonialism, of the displacement of indigenous peoples in favor of um, people of European descent, white people um, to uh, come and, and take their land and turn it over to to farming. And so we're going to see uh, through this story, really uh, a, a disadvantaging of uh, the Kazakhs in this. 
I want to start in 1897 when the engineer Kravtsev was sent by the governor general. He's kind of the person in charge of the steppe, and he's sent on an inspection tour of these resettlement districts where the government was trying to resettle um, peasants from European Russia into these regions, uh, in uh, specifically in Omsk and Petropavlsk areas uh, in what's now uh, Akhmola Oblast. And during the course of this inspection tour, he finds a big, uh, large array of water sources that are being used by the settlers to for drinking water and also to feed their crops uh, and, and livestock. And along uh, with the 16 villages that he locates that he says do not have enough water uh, to be able to sustain life, he also finds a series of wells whose water quality ranges broadly. Um, he finds some with perfectly fresh water, some with um, somewhat salty water, and some with very salty water. And this is a problem of arid environments is that salts um, can concentrate. And uh, you know, if you draw too much water out of them, um, eventually um, you can, you can uh, salinate basically your well and it's no longer usable even for livestock. So in addition to this quality of wells, he also finds that they're constructed by um, a large array of builders in the village in particular of of Krasnoyarsk, there was a lake nearby called um, Kudai Kuduk, uh, which gave water only during the springtime through into early June. In addition to this lake, uh, there were four wells. One was a well built by the government that was 65 feet deep and had 18 feet of water in it. Another one was a government well 70 feet deep with 44 feet of water. And there was an earlier um, Kazakh built well, uh, which was 35 feet deep and had just under four feet of water, as well as another peasant constructed well that was um, the same the same death, rather shallow at 35 feet, and just had one foot of water. This was not only the uh, shallowest well, it also was described as salty, while the other wells apparently had fresh water in them. Nevertheless, Krasnoyarsk was considered to be relatively lucky because it had enough water for the, to supply their, uh, the villagers. This collection, though, of infrastructure um, that has been constructed by, we see, Kazakhs, by peasants, by the government, um, is, I think, a crucial way of thinking about the, the development of, of the settlement project on the Kazakh steppe. Um, we see, you know, a wide array of actors and it's sort of really um, uh, typical for the, let's say, pre-1900 um, stage of settlement in the Kazakh steppe. Um, there's an imperial bureaucracy that's kind of scrambling, can barely keep up with all of these settlers coming into the region. Sometimes they're trying to outlaw them, other times they're trying to encourage them. Um, and it's very much a hodgepodge and very confused. And after 1900, we see a significant change where much more we get um, a, a new government ministries, especially the resettlement administration that basically becomes, in the words of one historian of this, uh, a, a colonial ministry really, who oversees all aspects of settlement and administration of this region. And that doesn't happen till after um, 1900 in, uh, in a significant way. So in some ways, this is, this is the chaos of pre-1900. Uh, for example, um, what's going to change, though, uh, is that after 1900, with the resettlement administration coming on board, there are all kinds of scientists, agronomists, and others. Um, for example, in 1909, just after Kravtsev's expedition, um, there is uh, a bunch of hydrotechnical expeditions going around, surveying uh, at this point almost two million acres, uh, and this is just one expedition out of out of several that take place. Uh, these surveys uh, are overseeing the construction of, of about 60 new wells, repairing dozens of other older wells and dams, and is undertaken by these 33 different uh, teams of hydrotechnological experts um, uh, who, who are put in charge of, of overseeing this work and making sure there's enough water. And so this is the post-1900 world where we have a, a government bureaucracy that's very much on board, um, centralizing, much more organized, much more top-down, and the scale of it just is a lot bigger than what we see happening before. So on the one hand, this is kind of this high modernism state you know, top-down uh, power of James Scott's imagination. Um, they have mobile laboratories with these scientists going around able to test, you know, the waters and develop, um, you know, geological surveys to try and understand what's going on beneath the surface. They're really excited about new well drilling technologies because they think this will open up huge amounts of artesian wells to access very, very deep um, water tables uh, in places where that hasn't previously been possible. 
So that's one way of telling this story, but I think that uh, there's a lot more that this uh, Krasnoyarsk example can tell us um, because Krasnoyarsk also reveals something in addition to the hodgepodge transformation into the you know, high modernism of these giant wells built by the government. We also see another important aspect and that's the environment. Um, the lake that supplies the water for only part of the year uh, is both an aid and a frustration to these uh, officials and these technicians. It's supplying water, yes, but doing so only on its own terms. And so while the, the aridity of the environment is a constraint certainly to settlement and the vision of what officials are up to, um, there is also another important environmental factor that I wanna talk about today. That is of course, Vibrio cholerae, the, the bacteria that causes cholera in humans. So the step, like the rest of the Russian Empire, uh, as uh, Dr. Davis just explained, uh, and is really the expert on this, and he's where I got all of my uh, background that is uh, somewhat limited in the role of cholera in the Russian Empire, uh, was as he's, you know, he, he listed the litany of scares uh, and real significant outbreaks, um, and was a major concern, of course, for officials, um, and it was especially a concern for those officials who were in charge of overseeing the steppe settlement. Cholera also occupies the minds of steppe residents. Um, their fears uh, are, are real and, and sometimes realized living in steppes and uh, living in cities and towns and villages. For example, in Omsk during the 1910 epidemic um, that Dr. Davis mentioned, the newspaper, the Omsk Telegraph, gave very frequent updates of the spread of this disease. And this is actually how I got interested in cholera. I was reading these newspapers uh, month after month of these steppe uh, newspapers in Omsk or Orenburg, uh, looking for something about new wells and something about water and wasn't finding anything. And instead I was just like, oh gosh, this cholera thing, it seems like a really big deal. Um, but it did give me this kind of sense of foreboding of this thing that was out there and it didn't seem like there was any way to stop it. So when cholera does eventually hit Omsk in 1910 in September, um, the newspaper does launch into these concrete descriptions. Uh, Dr. Davis talked about how, how many uh, aspects of, of government were in place across the entire empire uh, dealing with um, sanitation, trying to protect wells, trying to um, make sure that, you know, people didn't uh, throw litter into wells and all these kinds of things, make sure that the sale of animal products was um, controlled uh, and these public sanitation commissions were present in the in the steppe regions as well, which were not actually part of the Zemstva. Uh, this was a, actually a military occupation. Uh, officially, this governor general of the steppe was a military official, so there wasn't the civilian government of the Zemstva, but they were doing much the same thing on a local level. In in spite of these efforts, though, um, by September, uh, 90 residents of the city of Omsk had contracted the disease and 50% had died. So once again, we're seeing that 50% um, uh, roughly um, death rate from the disease. The outbreak that these residents in Omsk experienced and are reading about daily, uh, already by the time they were thinking about it, it had already hit other regions um, further to the west. Most specifically, uh, the region of Kostanai, uh, Kostanai Uyez, this is kind of the region of Kostanai, but also the capital city there is the town of Kostanai. It was ravaged by the 1910 outbreak. The first person there to fall ill from cholera, and we can actually once again contact trace this, um, was a 28-year-old peasant named Kazuma uh, Sashinkov. He had been hired by a merchant, uh, a man named Korsak Korsakov, uh, and he was hired to work in this guy's store um, in a, a place near what's today Chelyabinsk. Uh, and this was an important waypoint of all of these settlers coming into the region uh, they would, you know, ride the trains to Chelyabins, that's where the Trans-Siberian Railroad went through, and then they would go uh, by cart or foot um, down into uh, the steppe. So uh, this uh, town where the, the village, uh, where uh, Kazuma first contracted the disease, had already seen 120 cases of uh, cholera in July of 1910. Um, he then completed his work and returned home to his village of Vidinsky in the Kostanai region and fell ill on the 12th of July. By the time the district doctor found him and, and came to see him on the 14th of July, he was already feeling better. And this is it, cholera can, can kill you very quickly. Um, and, uh, or you, you, you uh, can often actually get better very quickly. Um, the doctor will carry out a disinfection of the places where Sashenkov has been, 
But um, the bacteria was already on its way into Kostanaya, probably in the bowels of other peasant settlers who would unknowingly come into the contact with water or food that Sashenkov had soiled. And for those of you who don't know, this is the thing we haven't actually been mentioning. Um, cholera is, for the most part, um, chronic diarrhea. Uh, so much you know, that you simply get dehydrated, you die of dehydration. Um, the famous uh, stool is uh, called rice water um, diarrhea to give you an idea of just like how, um, how voluminous luminous um, it is, and this is really hard to uh, keep things clean, and so food and water sources obviously can easily be infected by someone with this um, disease. So um, by August, uh, the region of Kostanai was already the site of a full-blown epidemic, so a couple weeks after um, uh, Kazuma was already feeling better. August 11th, Kostanai had 54 confirmed cases, 27 had died. In Akta Bay, another city in the region had 25 cases, and cholera had killed 15 of those. These are rather small towns, as you can see at this time. Much of the volume uh, of these cases was focused in these towns like Kostanai and Turgai, which had very little in the way of sanitary infrastructure, so sewage. They were large um, meat packing cities, basically, and skin sort of uh, hide industries going on there, very, very dirty places located on rivers. And so both of these towns relied on, on water supplied by the adjacent Tabol or Turgai rivers. But the hardest hit places, interestingly, in terms of percentage of the population in the steppe were settler villages, um, where the combination of poor water supply, poor nutrition, as uh, Dr. Davis mentioned, and just inadequate shelter, these were, you know, these are pioneers out there often without uh, much in the way of housing, leave their systems much more susceptible to the disease. Cholera arrives in the village of Kaminsky in Aktabay uh, Uyezd on the 10th of August. This is in that same Kostanai region. Um, and by the 18th of August, 54 have contracted the illness. 30 of them have died. Um, and the village is still reporting uh, five to six new cases a day. Um, this is not a large village, a few hundred people. Um, Officials pointed out that part of the reason Kaminsky suffered so severely was because there was a lack of clean drinking water um, in and around the village. Uh, it had been supplied by two small wells that the villagers had named Korsakovsky and Gladovsky. Uh, the naming of your wells is a thing. Um, and in fact, these wells were considered dirty even in uh, what the report said pre-COVID, uh, or pre-COVID, non-caloric -cal uh, times. So in order to stop the spread of the disease, officials ordered these dirty wells to be closed. Um, but closing the wells was not enough. Uh, settlers still needed water to survive and in search of a new source, the villagers uh, began to collect water from the river Ui, which was about eight miles from the village, which would have been fine, but it's about two miles downstream from another village of called Lugov, which had recently had its own cholera outbreak. Um, and so the water supply there was probably contaminated in the river as well. So the, the sanitary commission of this Kostanai region then asked the governor to request that this new ministry, this resettlement administration, dispatch a team of technicians to Kaminsky to identify new locations to build five new wells for the village and support the settlement on the steppe. On August the 22nd, the Turgai governor follows their recommendations um, and the hydraulic engineer Haldin was dispatched to Kaminsky to immediately begin construction of five new uh, brand new wells. On the 3rd uh, of November, the uh, sanitary executive committee um, met to discuss the summer and fall of the epidemic, how it had gone and to plan for future outbreaks. Members then reported that cholera had appeared in 11 populated places in the region, killing 130 uh, people, meaning that a quarter of the deaths actually occurred in Kaminsky, uh, probably due to this single well or this two well problem. The commission also requested that district doctors provide it with an update on the status of water supplies um, and early reports found that they were woefully inadequate. So in the spring of 1911, a year later, uh, the threat of cholera was of course in the air and water um, once again. So the governor of Turgai uh, Oblast, this kind of big region, um, wrote to the head of the resettlement administration, 
for that region and asked him to construct more wells, um, especially in several poorer communities that didn't have the resources to do it on their own. Um, he pointed to a direct correlation between the 1910 outbreak and the lack of clean water, writing, quote, the past epidemic polluted drinking water and severely contributed to the spread of the cholera, cholera epidemic. Therefore, I believe the measure proposed by the chairman of the Sanitary Commission asking for resettlement funds to be spent on wells to be appropriate. Now, ironically, um, much of the source of the cholera outbreaks was probably driven by more peasant settlers coming to the region. Uh, many of these came from what is today Ukraine, kind of around the Black Sea region, um, coming on these trains. We have a mobility issue here, um, as, um, as Dr. Davis mentioned. And so as the settler colonial project gets better and gets more successful as more and more people are brought in, more and more, uh, there's then going to be likely more and more cholera outbreaks, which will then also uh, drive up the demand for more and more uh, of these wells and more and more of this government support to keep these uh, settlers in the region. Um, uh, there's interestingly some evidence that there's also some old transmissions over the Silk Road direct to India, but also these, these Black Sea ports appear to be uh, a source of some of these outbreaks as well. So while the rapid expansion of well and dam building is carried out by these new, uh, you know, empowered and wealthy bureaucrats uh, in the resettlement administration, um, this is a story of, you know, kind of the growing state, the growing techno political project uh, and the settler colony, but it's not purely a story of a kind of a top-down project, except really in the imaginations of what these officials are, are talking about. Um, we've only talked about one aspect here today that kind of throws a monkey wrench in that, and that is uh, the, the, the bacteria um, itself. But also I think it's interesting to just you know, as we're thinking about disease to think about how, you know, the cholera bacteria isn't exactly an obstacle in this story. Um, it was an obstacle to the medical um, and sanitary officials, but actually for the hydraulic technicians, it's maybe encouraging more well building um, and more work for these to, uh, for these technicians. And in some ways we can even uh, go so far maybe as to, to propose that this uh, Vibrio cholerae is a, is a co-constructor uh, of these wells alongside of those um, bureaucrats. And in this way, we can see how cholera is helping perhaps settlement. It's retrenching power. Um, you know, we might expect the disruptions that disease cause to uh, cause states or cause the powerful to be weakened. Um, and I think that, you know, this, this illustrates how that's not always the case, how um, a, 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 a pandemic, uh, the upheavals that disease cause are perhaps just as likely to kind of retrench the powerful um, at the expense of the powerless, in this case, um, the Kazakhs, because as more and more settlement uh, is brought into the region, they're able to cut uh, with, with uh, settlement, they're able to cut the migration patterns uh, of these uh, Kazakh nomads and they're forced to give up their nomadism um, in a major way. Um, I think this raises some big questions for us that I just wanna, um, you know, pinpoint, you know, why, why, does, why does the Kazakh step matter? I mean, I think that, that fundamentally this question of power and do, does disease um, actually create new opportunities for, um, for maybe the powerless, um, uh, perhaps, but also I think we need to be aware that it can actually um, fully retrench um, power structures as they exist, certainly raising some questions about what uh, Dr. Prairie had to say about social justice. I think also the question of infrastructure. Uh, we certainly see that um, in this story, who gets it and who doesn't. Um, the health disparities that have come with COVID uh, just in the United States in terms of, um, uh, of, of uh, race and uh, ethnicity and class um, certainly would indicate um, that um, there's, there's an infrastructure imbalance, um, certainly about the ways that these um, vaccines are being distributed now as we enter this next stage of the, the pandemic with vaccines. And we see you know, these maps um, of the world that show you know, that in, it's not until perhaps 2023 that uh, formerly colonized places in Africa or Latin America are likely to begin receiving um, the vaccine. And so once again, this is a question of infrastructure, who has it, who gets it, um, and how that intersects with disease. And I think what that can, what, what questions that can cause us to ask about um, the, the, the uh, about disease and pandemics, I think is a, is a really pressing um, and important question for us right now. Thanks. Thank you, Jack. Well, um, thank you to all three of our panelists for these stimulating, engaging 
uh, presentations. And now we've got uh, a couple of questions that have appeared in the chat box and I will read them in turn. If you have a question uh, to address to individual panelists or to the panel as a whole, um, just uh, type in. So first up, uh, a question for Dr. Prairie. You said something to the effect of individualism, that individualism doesn't exist in public health. To what extent have you seen public health experts and other policymakers framing the COVID-19 pandemic as a collective or social problem requiring collective or social responses as opposed to an individual problem? Do I need to unmute anybody or? Yes, thank you. Oh, God. <laughs> thank you. And Sean, that's a great question. And what's interesting is that several um, public health programs throughout the United States, I can turn on my video as well, or, um, tried campaigns, awareness campaigns tied around the we are all in this together, whether it was wearing masks, social distancing, quarantine, or now getting vaccines. And what's interesting is we have a set of people who see these requests. And if you take out vaccines outside of the equation, which, you know, I'm vaccinated, but um, just like wearing a mask is something that's so simple that people see as an oppressive action against them. And so I myself have, am thinking like, how do we address that? How do we, and I think, the, and I love the fact that we have this symposium because I think the missing link here is like, you can try to, try to tap into someone's empathy, but with the lack of memory of how things were during other times, I think that impacts how some people react. And so they're less empathetic, less likely to participate in basic public health social interventions, um, regardless of how many um, campaigns you might throw. Hmm. I hope that answers the question. I know that's not a, the greatest positive response. <laughs> Any follow up there? Thanks, Tara. Okay. Um, a second question um, for any of our presenters. In this COVID pandemic, particularly in the United States, distrust of science has played a large role in excusing anti public health attitudes and continues to play a large role in perpetuation of vaccine myths. In your preparations for your presentations, do you see evidence in the past of anti-science, uh, anti-medicine themes complicating the response to cholera? And if so, can these inform our approach to battling anti-science sentiments today? This is uh, for all of our presenters. I'll t uh, speak to that if I may. Um, this is John Davis. In, in Russia, during the sixth car pandemic and the fifth car pandemic, absolutely, you saw a massive, I mean, it was much worse than it is today. Uh, they killed several physicians. Um, many of the physicians were seen as agents of the government coming to kill people. Uh, you, you had uh, the, the idea that if you went into the, the um, the barracks, the cholera barracks, you would never return. And of course, many of them didn't. So there's, there's, the facts are kind of feeding their, their, um, their paranoia. Why don't the physicians get sick? Well, of course the physicians did get sick, but they're also, they're, they're practicing good cleanliness. Why are all the physicians Jews? The Jews are trying to kill us. Um, th and th this led to a lot of, uh, anti-Semitism and uh, programs. And, and yes, it was, it, was, it was very terrible. It was very hazardous to be a physician uh, 
I mean, I mean, these guys to me are, have, are absolutely heroes. I can't even imagine being a physician in Russia in 1892. You have diphtheria, you have typhus, it, uh, all these childhood diseases, uh, all, all these plus cholera. It, it, and you're basically up against a, a populace that just didn't understand. And, and a government that's not really helping you much either, because I mean, in one case, uh, they were they were going to send medical uh, treatment to one besieged area that had cholera, and they sent a, sh a shipment of of coffins. So the government's incompetent too. So absolutely, the, the, it was much worse than it is today. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah, and I can follow up on that too. But Jack, did you have something to say? Go ahead first. Oh well, because especially like I think from the part of the the era of cholera that I studied, you know, they were battling something different. Like people were holding on to miasma theory so strongly that cognitive dissonance was so strong in that group. And so when you have Jon Snow and you have um, Pacini presenting this evidence and even like outside of cholera, you have an example of like Ignaz um, Semmelweis who discovered well, childbed fever, which was basically women dying of sepsis. And he found that doctors were moving from dissecting rooms to maternity wards without washing their hands. And so you, and this was just 10 years after um, the cholera epidemic in London. And he ended up being put into an asylum from a mental breakdown from being ostracized by people not supporting actual scientific evidence that miasma theory was not a thing. And so I don't I don't know how it's, I don't know how do we how do we fix that when the when people like just desperately try to hold on to that cognitive dissonance. I think I I think this is a, a a really fascinating question. And also, I, I also wonder about kind of the, the parameters of it. Like, are we actually talking about a distrust of science? Um, I, I don't know if that's actually what, you know, people, I mean, sci what is science in that way? I mean, or are we talking about like a rather typical um, distrust of expertise? Um, are we talking about um, a, a distrust or a disdain for science that that doesn't do the things that I wanted to do, right? Uh, I, I I think that the framing of it is um, is not maybe not always the most useful thing. That sort of there's been a partisan push to make on the one hand the claim that you know one in the United States one side supports science and the other side is anti-science. Well, you know both of them use nuclear weapons. They both you know they or would be willing to. Um, they're both willing to use science in the most broad sense of the term. Um, so I think that that actually maybe isn't even the, the right way to begin unpacking this problem, but I think instead it's identifying sort of what people's interests are in terms of, um, you know, why, why they're acting in certain ways and trying to put it in, a, in these kind of abstract terms of like, do you or don't believe in science, I'm not sure is really a useful way of getting, um, you know, uh, it may be the way of getting to truth, but I'm not sure that it's actually a way to get to like a, a a public health response. I mean, I think to the, you know, the question of of global warming as the great example of this before COVID was, you know, do the CEOs of ExxonMobil actually think that global warming isn't real? Um, probably not. Most of them probably believe that it is a real thing, but they have this vested interest in not, in not believing it, right? Um, and so I think maybe the, the, the framework of, of science or not science can actually, uh, for the vast majority of people who are not scientists or public health experts, um, can actually kind of obscure some of this when we're talking about the, the political conversation. Um, and, uh, and so maybe that's part of why we get stuck, <laughs> um, sort of like, like Tara is saying. Another question um, for Dr. Davis, but actually possibly the whole panel. Um, can you comment on the production of vaccines for cholera, uh, just in terms of timeline, uh, how long did it take? Um, was there financial sponsorship uh, of research? Um, 
and how were vaccines distributed? Um, did individual physicians do that or were, were there other means by which uh, uh, folks uh, receive vaccines? Well, that, that is an excellent question. So thank you for that. Uh, the, the vaccines, they really uh, were in a competition between the French and, and the, the Germans. And most of the Russians were on the side of the French. They were mostly in the Pasteur Institute versus Robert Koch. And, and, and of course, they hated one another, <laughs> and, which brought the Russians in under the side of, of Pasteur. Because really, for, for many reasons, a lot of the scientific theories just coalesce better with, with what Pasteur was talking about. And uh, it, 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 of course, the great genius of, of um, vaccines is considered to be Ehrlich of, of Germany, but I, I Meshnikov of, of Russia was, was very good as well. Unfortunately, uh, he, in Odessa, in the, libra in the laboratory there, uh, was blamed with starting a pan, a, a, a local epidemic of um, anthrax, I believe it was. And so they, they ran into complications, but the Russians had very good vaccination programs from the 1880s on. Odessa was the first one that you had them all over um, uh, European Russia. And, and uh, they were namely, a, a, like in Moscow, you had the, the vaccination uh, laboratory under the Gabrachevsky, uh, Dr. Gabrachevsky. They were mostly subsidized by the, by the government and, and, um, and, and, um, and, and they were, I guess there was eight to 10 of them. They did very good work. They, they started out like most uh, vaccination programs have started out is that they start vaccinating foreigners. I mean, this is, this is what they do. So in 1896, they go to Japan and start vaccinating people there. Uh, they, they, in 1904, uh, a couple of them went to Persia and vaccinated all kinds of people. They didn't have the science down really at all. Uh, they had hoped to have it in, in place by 1892, but they, it just was not there and, and they knew it. So they're, they're, they're on the borders really practicing. By 1907, they, they practiced that a, a little bit in, uh, on the Volga in, in uh, Zaritsyn, which is, is, uh, is now Volgograd. But uh, it, it, I don't know how it works because the, the fond, I, I couldn't get the fond. They, 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 get, they, they said it was a polka. It's bad. Uh, so you can't read it. They, they said, unfortunately, I, I never got to find out about 1907. Uh, somebody probably will someday. But then in 1915, they, by 1915, they had a very good vaccination program under a fellow by the name of L.A. Tarasevich, who is really kind of the Dr. Fauci. He's the hero of Russian medicine um, in, in, in the cholera in, in the 1920s, uh, had been to the Pasteur incident, uh, Institute and worked with all the major folks there. And uh, actually, actually and, and it shames me to say this, but uh, it was a lot of, of, of nurses who are, are and uh, female physicians who, who was running the program in Moscow. I, I can't think of, of any names right now, which is what shames me. But uh, it, it did very, very good that the, um, the morbidity, uh, how many people are the, are the mortality, how many people died was very, very small, uh, incredibly small, uh, almost to the extent to where I think either the vaccination worked or the, or the, the statistics are wrong. It, it, it was that much different. And I, I, I really believe that, that the vaccinations played a role in that. Uh, in 1918, they sent female vaccine, uh, vaccine experts out into various important areas like the upper Volga, which was a very crucial point. A fellow by the name of D.K. Zabalotny was running uh, the Institute of Experimental Medicine and sent them out into the battlefield. This is what they did differently is they, they went right out and, 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 and pulled uh, right from the, the nature of various vibrioles, as, as they called it, uh, bowel vibrioles, because they already knew about numerous uh, offshoots of the, of the cholera vibrio, and they knew they were important. Uh, but vaccination sprung from all of this and really did not really start working out so well. I, 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 although I do think 1915, but definitely by 1921, uh, it, they started really to wipe out cholera. They went wherever there was cholera and just vaccinated everybody in sight. They had very good campaigns that, at, at uh, around railroad stations where they would just set up and, and they would just vaccinate everybody in sight. And they gave them a little card, just like we get with our, our, our COVID. 
uh, you had your, your cholera card. The army got first, and the, of course, the army was fed the best as well. But by 1924, I, I really credit vaccination with what with absolutely running cholera out of Russia uh, back towards India. I, I, that, that actually, if I could just uh, tag on to that, uh, what you were saying actually made me think something back to uh, Dr. Wilhite's question about you know, how do we, how do we fix this? <laughs> and you, yeah. in your talk, you mentioned to defeat cholera, you have to have cholera, right? And how, um, you know, uh, it's, it, it's a, it's a way of proving your mettle, right? And then certainly, uh, yes. from what I remember in, in your book, um, this was a way of the Soviets, right? Like literacy and COVID, you know, just a few years <laughs> after the revolution, or COVID, I keep doing that, and cholera, defe you know, defeating both just a few years after the revolution. Um, this is like an aggrandizing project. And I guess, it, it sort of made me think that there's there's potentially two sides to this. On the one hand, that this kind of uh, you know nationalism, uh, the question um, you know uh, of you know using sort of the national uh, project and pride, which sort of seems to be a trend in the Biden administration, right? For this is why we're going to battle COVID as Americans. Um, but there's also you know then a dark side to it um, that is. You know, we get all these news stories about how well China Chinese spies are coming over to steal our information about a COVID vaccine. So that that's going to help them, right? Uh, but not help us because still the framework of that national uh, project uh, is still leaves us all um, vulnerable, right? And so I think that while there's some great potential potentially to reframe, you know, the fight against COVID as as war or, or as a as a patriotic undertaking that also only gets you part of the way there because you can stop it at your borders and cholera is a great example of this. But if you don't, uh, you know, stop it elsewhere, uh, it doesn't really necessarily do you a whole lot of, a whole lot of good. Well, comment in the chat about, um, oh, here's another. Uh, about um, uh, tragic introduction of cholera in Haiti by UN troops from South Asia uh, being instructive. And uh, Dr. Prairie responds. Um, and Vibrios of all species, I think, do well in shallow marine coastal areas with rich bottom sediment, but only a few Vibrios are equally at home in freshwater. Interesting, the proclivity of Vibrio species for salt is used to enhance the growth of in vitro of diagnostic specimens uh, by 1%. Um, in ACL. <laughs> I'm a theologian. I don't have to. <laughs> um, That, that's very interesting uh, th that he, he's absolutely right. I mean, this is what I'm talking about in, 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 in uh, estuaries uh, and, and uh, under the right conditions, which th that followed an earthquake, if, if you recall, in 2010 in, in, in Haiti. And right away, you had an argument between the modern scientists. Uh, Rita Caldwell was one who says, and, and, and I totally agree with Professor Caldwell, um, that it can live there. It lives there for many, many years in, the, in these areas. And then when something like an earthquake happens and, and you have changes in tides, it kicks up the bottom and set sediments in estuaries, which are probably the most organic place on the face of the planet, more organic than, than even uh, forest and, 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 and other places. And, and this is where mo a lot of our diseases come from. And, and the first thing I did when, when COVID come out is I looked to see if, if uh, this fish market was near an estuary. It's not, but I, I am not so sure that that uh, estuaries cannot contaminate a river pretty far upriver. Now, now that um, village in in China was really far upriver, but this is absolutely correct. And 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 I um, always I would look immediately uh, to and if I were you know investigating an epidemic. To, to the location where it's at and, and, and what could have caused this. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, it happens to be a La Nina year, right? And we had all these, these uh, tornadoes right about the time. I mean, I think we're gonna find out a lot about COVID. You know, I, I could be wrong, but uh, 
cholera and disease in general is, is environmental, but it's also, it's also contagious, you know, and, and, and this is something that we can do uh, something about, but, but that is, that is true. What is written there. That, that's excellent. Good. Good. Well, um, we are at 734, even by Tennessee Wesleyan time, um, and our time frame uh, brought us to 730. Uh, if there, are there any other questions or comments for our panelists? Well then, uh, Dr. Prairie, uh, Dr. Davis, and Dr. Seitz, thank you very much for this informative time uh, that really puts uh, the current pandemic in, in uh, much needed perspective. Uh, lots to think about and look forward to um, learning more uh, this week in this excellent program. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I really enjoyed it. Nice to meet you. Have a great night. Thank you. You too. You too. Bye-bye.